Hi, Gretchen. Oops, there we go. Hi, how are you doing today? Oh, pretty well. Been a busy day. I was in Bismarck most of the day, and now I'm at my parents' farm near Drake, middle of the state. So, wowzers. Lots of driving. Yeah. How's, how's your day been going? Pretty good. Well, pretty okay. We've got several different kinds of aphids that are spreading from the thistles to the peppers no. and tomatoes. So that's kind of frustrating. Yeah, we've got some kind of a squash bug, it looks like, that's on the grapes. So, other than that, good. <laughs> yeah, those darn pests. Yes. They have their place, but I wish it wasn't on the producing plants. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Hi, Shane. Hello. Oh, and hi, Grace. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Are you feeling better, Shane? Are you, is your rib starting to heal? Well, I found out it was my rotator cuff. I took five <laughs> days off, and it's about 50, 80%, somewhere in there. It hurts every day. I wake at 4 o'clock in the morning taking a bath, but... Oh, shoot. Yep. And my computer broke, so I'm on my phone, so. <laughs> no worries. I, I understand. I'll be turning my video on in a few minutes, so you will have some faces to look at and just okay. scarfing down some food. Well, good to hear you, Jess. Um, I know that Toby said she was hoping to join us tonight, but might be a bit late because she's doing CSA. Um, I'll wait a minute or two. Hopefully, Alex will pop on. Who else? Oh, Jake. Um, who else are we waiting for? Ashana, maybe. Well, why don't we go ahead and start with an opening question um, while we're waiting for others to pop in. Um, oh, here's El here's Alex. Um, and this must be Toby as well. Is is, uh, is that you, Toby? Yeah, it's me. Okay, great. So I'm glad you could join the class today. I hope CSA went well. Yeah, it did. It went great. Oh, great. Well, um. We're reaching the end of our intern season, at least the, the formal class portion. Um, some of you will be going back to school towards the end of August, and some of you will be continuing on through the end of your farm season. Um, but uh, this week and next week, we're going to be kind of winding down the classes. And so just like you started out your season planting things and tending them, and then eventually you started harvesting them, um, we started out planting and tending, you know, the knowledge in your head and we're at the point where we're harvesting that 
if I can use a metaphor, because I like to do that. Um, so uh, I think Felicity may have mentioned, but I will uh, tell you all again, um, save the date for August 23rd. That is midweek, I believe it's a Tuesday. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we are going to have an intern celebration at Bear Creek Winery in Fargo. That's going to be an evening event about 4, 4.30, 5 until about 8 o'clock. So um, for those that are traveling from further away, we can, um, I'm thinking about getting, uh, making arrangements for some Airbnbs so that we have a place to spend the night if we need to um, in Fargo. At least farm staff will be spending the night. And so um, if you're coming from far away, you're welcome to as well. Um, or we can reimburse a hotel for you all. Um, and so that is that is a celebration of everything that you have learned this season and accomplished. Um, you've been doing some really awesome independent projects. You've built skills in leadership and problem solving, as well as practical, you know, hands-on, you know, pest management and soil health and um, harvesting and marketing, um, really applicable farming skills. So, um, we're going to have a meal at Bear Creek. We're going to have a tour, um, but this is also an opportunity for you to invite uh, those closest to you, friends or family, um, those that you want to tell about what you learned. And we're going to spend part of the evening for you to show off what you learned. And so this week and next week, we're going to do review and reflection. Um, to help you prepare to talk about what you've learned with the group and with your loved ones. So the opening question, um, since we're all about harvest now, what is something that you've been harvesting from the garden that you're most excited about? Or sorry, the farm. These are farms, not gardens. Um, we'll start with Jess. Well, uh, today and yesterday, well, today I was actually on campus, so not my internship, but uh, this week I have spent a lot of time harvesting garlic. Uh, it, that's it's been a lot of work, um, two huge plots of it <clears throat> between the two places I'm working. So um, that I'm definitely excited about because there's, there's like, it's such an easy thing to plant and maintain and such an awesome payoff um, that like we can use all year. So that, and also a lot of the, the like ornamental, um, sunflowers and the cut, the cut, the cut flowers have been really, really fun to harvest and like make look pretty and sell at markets. So. Definitely. Um, how about Gretchen? What is some of the harvest that you've been most excited about? Um, so our garden looks a little bit different this year. They cut it about in half from last year um, and kind of focused on basically a salsa mix. So we've got garlic, tomatoes, peppers, and onions is kind of the bulk of it. Um, oh, I guess, so the black currants, they have a couple black currant bushes and this is our first year producing. So I was pretty excited to um, see those producing and you get to harvest that. That was kind of cool because I've never worked with them at all. Definitely. Yeah. I, I bet they're delicious. Yes. Yeah, such an, a complex flavor. It's cool. Um, how about you, Shane? <clears throat> okay, well, I just tried to text in the chat how old are those uh black currant trees or bushes whatever um they, they planted them yeah they planted them last year from like sticks and they're producing this year already oh awesome yeah they even got mowed over once so they're <laughs> <laughs> really? back story nice <clears throat> okay so for me 
Harvesting, I haven't been back to harvest yet as tomatoes. I spent a lot of time training them and pruning them and getting them set up. And the last week that I worked, I got to try the very first tomato that was ripe and it was like sugar candy. It was amazing. So I'm super excited to go back this week and see what the high tunnel looks like with all the cucumbers hanging and all the tomatoes and all of it from two weeks. I'm super excited. <clears throat> and then for learning purposes, lettuce. So we've been doing lettuce since before farmer's market started. And he does Charles Dowding method where it's pick and come again. So you pick and pick and pick by hand, all the beds. And I know that when I start my farm, I don't care about the expense. I will be growing baby lettuce mix with a baby lettuce harvester. And I will not be hand harvesting any lettuce anymore, or I'll have Salanova where I can cut off a whole head and it'll grow again and cut off a whole and I'll do a, a different, I love his lettuce mix and it lasts and it's delicious, but my back doesn't like it. So I know that I won't be doing pick and come again lettuce. I will be growing and hand harvesting or a baby greens harvester for sure. Absolutely. Those are great lessons. I've seen videos of those baby greens harvesters. It's like, wow. From my experience growing a ridiculous amount of lettuce with hydroponics at the college, that is my least favorite thing to harvest and wash and pack. So I do not blame you for wanting to have, have it like a little bit uh, mechanic, uh, mechanized, I guess. <laughs> Um, Alex, uh, hopefully you've gotten to do some harvesting at your new site. Um, yeah, I, I have, um, I'm still kind of learning like flower names at this point, but we harvested a ton of zinnias today. Um, and I've been working on harvesting, um, sunflowers at the start of every day. So those two are both like our main ones at this point. Um, the zinnias are having like some trouble with some of the, like, some of the patches are maybe getting infected with something. So we've been putting bleach in the water and washing our clippers in between each row so it doesn't spread, which I thought was pretty interesting. And I didn't know that bleach would be okay, even like a small amount. I thought that would just like full on kill the flowers, but apparently it doesn't. So yeah. What symptoms are you seeing through zinnias? Uh, I think it's just like yellowing leaves around the base and stuff and like the flower petals were like getting I don't know exactly what it is because I didn't see a lot of it I'm new to flowers and so I can't really spot the differences between it as well right now but I'm hoping that I can see a little bit more of that but yeah yeah sure I wouldn't know anything about it I was just curious <laughs> yeah we mainly like around the base of the plants though is what my host farmer was talking about was just like yellowing or like browning leaves and like, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting that's on the leaves. We've, we've, we've been dealing with like, once we harvest the zinnias, the petals like start turning brown at, at the tips like really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and we think like it must be the like water quality. It's just like rural water that we're using. So we are like, yeah are starting to do the the bleach yeah. trick and I agree I was like what mm -hmm. bleach that seemed mm -hmm. like it would just kill it but mm -hmm. yeah and my my farmer also works with dried flowers and she's mentioned that zinnias just do not last as long as other flowers do they're really pretty but they will fade fairly quickly so same with dahl dahlias like Mm -hmm. it seems like that's everyone's like favorite like cut flower but they just like you, you after a day they just start yeah. fading so quick so like they're really cool when you can like dry them out same with the mm -hmm. zinnias so we are kind of all doing the same thing I guess yeah yeah well and Toby uh you said you came from doing CSA so I know you've been harvesting some things out at uh North Star Organics and we'd love to hear about it yeah, um, we've been actually harvesting like a ton. So like, I guess it's hard to pick like a, like, I don't know, my favorite. Um, we've been doing like a ton of garlic, like 
just so much. So I don't know if it's my favorite because there's just so much of it. But we did kohlrabi, which is actually really fun to harvest. Um, and then we did some peas, which normally those are really fun to pick, but there's just not very many this year for some reason. Uh, but we ended up replanting just to see what would happen, not in around any pea trellises. And there's some pods already growing. And it's not really normal since it's like almost the middle of August. So that's pretty exciting. So we'll probably be able to get some more peas, which that's probably what I'm probably one of my favorites to harvest. <laughs> And um, Jess put in the chat that I think you you visited Marv's farm earlier in the year, right? Yeah, he was my um, mentor for farm beginnings. So I went out and saw it like right at the beginning of the season. And so I, yeah, I don't envy um, how much garlic and onions and all of those root crops you're going to be harvesting because yeah, yeah. he has quite, quite the large... Uh, production there of, like of root crops something, I think for garlic and then for onions um we're waiting we're waiting a while to start harvesting just to see how big they can get and they're already just they're producing so well this is probably one of the best garlic crops he's ever had so we're pretty excited about it but it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit to get all of it so um did did he ever get those other greenhouses set up uh, well, he has one that isn't set up, but he has two large tunnels. Okay, up, yeah, because he was he was talking about uh, getting those uh, like the the other one that it's disassembled, put up, and I've been expecting a, a call from him to come help out with that. So yeah, I heard he's going to try probably next summer with that. One. Ah, yeah, it's been a busy one. Yeah, yeah, very much. But we hadn't, we haven't had to irrigate at all, which is a plus because irrigating is a lot of work. So the moisture in the ground has stayed pretty well. So that's pretty nice. Well, that's awesome. And being like, he's like right on the river there, like. Yep, right free, on the Free water source. So. Yep, yep. But we haven't had to use it, which is. That's which so is nice. awesome. Save some work. <laughs> For sure. Such a good, he's got a, such a good setup there. So. Yeah. He really Where does. is that setup at? Carpio. Um, Yep, right by Carpio. Carpio, okay, thank you. So I was going to talk about uh, Reflect on the Field Day, and we will, but um, since you guys were talking, um, maybe we should start with uh, updates on your projects. And um, Toby, are, do you, are you comfortable talking about the, the tour that you're doing? Uh, yeah. Um, that's coming up on August 21st, which I think is a Sunday. Um, pretty much I've gotten to know each of the plants pretty well. And then we're going to have all of our like CSA shareholders come out. So look rounding about like 60 people right now. Wow. And eight of those are children. So it's going to be pretty fun. And we're just going to do like a walkthrough, like just super chill, like just a walkthrough of just telling them about the plants and like some facts about it like some just I don't know there's some special facts about some things we're growing that are just really interesting and then after that we're going to be doing a you pick so each shareholder gets to pick what they have paid for pretty much so they get hands-on learning experience so especially people from the air force who don't really experience stuff like that it's going to be pretty cool for their kids to experience and then after that we have um there's a barbecue restaurant place in Berthold that is going to be like catering for us. And so we got all get to sit down and eat lunch and talk about the tour and stuff like that. And so it'll be a really good experience and pretty fun day for everyone. Absolutely. Um, would you, is there room for farms to provide assistance and would it be possible for some additional interns to come out and visit like if Shane and Jess wanted to come out yeah I think absolutely because I'm I'm almost positive you know not all the CSA shareholders can make it um but I mean if there's any way anybody could contact Marvin because it's kind of an mm -hmm. RSV to get enough food but I'm definitely sure yeah there would be enough I'll, 
I'll send him an email tonight and and ask about that because that would be awesome. I've been meaning to head out there and see things at this time of year. Yeah. So yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. There's gonna be a lot of people there, and I don't know how the tour is gonna go. We'll find out. I'm kind of kind of kind of a shy speaker, so we'll see how that goes. But yeah, you said that's gonna be on a Sunday, right? Yeah, it should be August 21st. That should be a Sunday. So Okay, it, that's perfect. I agree. That is also yeah, that's that's yes. pretty yeah. perfect so, timing for Yeah, even if I don't even really care about the food, if you can just get me in on the tour and all of the other stuff, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, both if you're able to come for the first part, I mean, food is definitely like you definitely are welcome for both parts. So Yeah, I'll be in mine out anyway on the farm with Paul, so um and they the, he tries to do this type of thing every year he's done a you pick um there's a question in the chat I don't know who read it but um he tries to do the you pick or like a tour every year if he can um but he wants to do it like he wants to do it more like traditionally like every year so yeah well I will reach out to Marvin but I mean if if interns can come along like farms can certainly like make it worth worth your guys's time like we could help with logistics or something if there's anything you need help with yeah i'm already writing an email to him right now so (laughs) i'm already inviting myself everything's been planned out pretty well so um i think yeah i mean we're still waiting on people to rsvps so it should be totally fine okay well like i said he can put us to work parking cars or whatever <laughs> all righty yeah i'll definitely i'll see him tomorrow so I'll, I'll let you know i'll let him know so and i hope that's i'm volunteering you guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i figured <laughs> um does anybody else want to share about updates on their projects well my project kind of changed because I was working on um, like composting at my first farm. And now it's kind of switched to like season extension and trying to find ways that my host farmer can like harvest things and keep them for longer so they can sell them like after crops have stopped growing or like we worked on um, making like a indoor growing area um, set up with like lights and stuff so that they can start plants a little bit sooner and then continue them a little bit longer after the like outdoor season is over, so. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you've seen them already and I don't know if they're as applicable for flowers, but they might be, but uh, NDSU Extension has a, a web page on season extension with some videos about oh cool high tunnels and things um i can find the link and send it out after class i probably won't succeed in trying to do that while i facilitate class but i can send it out after yeah that would be awesome thank you um shane i know you've been out the past week, but uh, I saw some really cool progress on your experience reports and time cards about your um, indigenous microorganisms. No. Yes, that's correct. Good job. IMOs. Yeah. So what has progressed this week? I ordered stuff I haven't put in my um, thing through the pay card thing yet, but I ordered, which is really expensive. Angelica root, I need angelica root, licorice root, cinnamon bark, garlic, and um, why are you slipping my brain right now? It's another root herb, it's uh, ginger. So one part of everything, two parts of angelica root, and then the garlic and the ginger are fresh and they go through an F. PJ or a fermented plant juice process, which is just equal parts. Well, not equal parts. It's pretty much equal, pretty much equal parts plant to brown sugar. 
Um, some plants are more moist and have more water content. So as the brown sugar gets them, you don't want it too wet, but you want it everything coated evenly with a little bit of moisture. And then you set that aside and you let it ferment for three to five days. And then you strain out every, everything out of there. And the liquid that you have left over is your uh, fermented plant juice, your FPJ. So then you have your FPJ, you set that aside. If you really want to get into it, you could take the remains of what you made your FPJ and you could add three to one water to it and make vinegar out of it. But that's a separate story. We're not doing that yet. So then you go to the <clears throat> angelica root, licorice root, and cinnamon bark is all dehydrated and it's two parts angelica, one part everything else. And you rehydrate that in a beer ferment and then those everything gets mixed together in an, another ferment with brown sugar and then vodka and goes through a from and that's called your um oriental herbal nutrient ohn so then you have white rice and you give your white rice a wash and you save the wash water and then you put your lid on that and you let that ferment in a dark place for three to five days until you have your um, whey and your curd and it'll actually separate like that like you're making cheese and you can save the curd and make a simple cheese but you save the whey and that's your lactic acid bacteria or LAB and so you have your LAB and your OHN and your FPJ and then you inoculate, then you make some rice. So you cook up some rice and you want it like al dente. Like if you brought it to a party and somebody ate it, they'd spit it out and be like, wow, this rice isn't cooked all the way, who made this? So then you make your rice that way. And you, as you're making it, you inoculate it with your liquids as you're making the rice. And then you set your rice in cedar boxes that I made, you just go buy cedar, uh fence paneling from ace you get one of them for four dollars now and i made one box out of one and had enough scraps about five about five planks and i made six boxes and you cut them perfectly at 10 inches and then you can staple a paper towel perfectly a full-size paper towel will then staple 11 by 10 onto the top of it so you fill it two-thirds of the way full of that el dente rice staple your paper towel onto it, bring it out into a forest or somewhere that has untouched soil that you can dig into it and see mycorrhizal activity. You can see the white strands that you should only see under a microscope, but it's so prevalent out there. You can just dig down six inches, not even three inches into the leaf mold and it's just white everywhere. So then you build like a, a cage out of like chicken wire type stuff and just like a box that you can fit your other box into so critters don't get into it so when mm -hmm. you have your cedar box two-thirds of the way full of rice with a paper towel stapled on top of it inserted into your chicken wire cage to keep critters out of it underneath the trees in the denby forest where there's a bunch of mycorrhizal activity going on you go and you collect some more of the white fun stuff and you sprinkle it onto the outside rim of the box with a paper towel on it you don't want anything in the center because it'll break and then <clears throat> you get a tarp and you string a tarp over the top of it so no rain can get to it in case it rains and something would get through the paper towel and break the paper towel it would ruin everything so you have to keep it so it can get enough light with not any water and then you come back in five to seven days and that rice should be full of a bloom of white and it'll start to fold over on itself and look a little gray. And the, the rice should be almost like a cakey consistency. And then you have IMO one. Wow. And then you don't have to, if you don't have the OHN or the other stuff, it's okay, but it's highly recommended that you do all that stuff first because you'll get a better inoculation. And so what you're doing is breeding 
so like Elaine Ingham does her compost and she focuses on letting it all go through its process and going through compost and you get all of the beneficials that you get out of it. But what they're doing in Korean natural farming is they're actually harvesting the most beneficial microorganisms that are available in your area. And the higher altitude that you actually collect your IMOs from, the more beneficial it'll be. If you collect them from a low elevation and bring them to a high elevation, it will do nothing. But if you collect them from the top of a mountain and bring it down to North Dakota, it'll be blowing up with life. It's crazy. And I also need to get ocean water. Ocean water is an ingredient when you mix the IMO, after you mix the IMOs, to, you get your rice, then you inoculate that into uh, a carbon pile. So we're gonna get wood chips and we chip it down into a, a, a consistency enough where that once I mix water and a little bit of native dirt with it, that I can squeeze it and my in between my knuckles, you'll get a couple drops but there'll be nothing sopping wet. So what you do with the IMO is you actually take that with, so the pile that we're gonna use, we're gonna use four gallons of water and in the four gallons of water, so you have your inoculated rice. So you put your IMO rice into there and well, actually what you do with your IMO is you put it to sleep with brown sugar. So the brown sugar makes a, chemical bond on all of the water molecules that are available to those microorganisms. And by mixing it with more brown sugar, it locks up all the available water that the microorganisms need to eat. So by locking it up into a chemical bond with the brown sugar, all of the IMO rice that you just harvested, they just go to sleep. They go dormant into a brown sugar mix. And it's like a wet mix. It's, it gets, it's wet, like um, sticky rice wet. Like, and then, so that goes to sleep and then it's dormant. Like it'll just stay asleep until you want to use it. And then what you do with that is then you get four gallons of water and you inoculate that with your FPJ, your OHN, your LAB, your uh, brown rice vinegar, um, humic acid, and ocean water. And so my sister was in Florida when I was doing this. So she brought me back enough ocean water to make the first IMO to go from IMO one to IMO two is the brown sugar from IMO two to IMO three is mixing with all this water now. So you inoculate the water solution and then you take your uh, IMO one that you made or your IMO two now, cause you mixed it with brown sugar and you take that and there's a recipe and you mix into the water and then you take the wood chips and a little bit of native dirt and you make it like a compost pile and you pour some of the water in and you mix it around with a shovel and mix it by hand. And it's a lot of work and then more water and more water until you get the perfect consistency where you're squeezing it and the water's coming out and then you treat it like a compost pile. You don't want it to get too hot. You have to turn it right away within the first 24 hours, even if it's not heating up, you still want to turn it right away because you don't want it to get too hot like a compost pile would because that'll kill too much. So you turn it right away and within five days, so it has to be in an outside place that's covered from the rain so it can stay dry, but outside on the dirt is best. And so then, once that's done after three to five days, then you mix up another batch of the water, same solution and whatever, but this time you add a nitrogen rich base. So chicken manure. So then you have your carbon that you've already inoculated. Then you inoculate your nitrogen in the same fashion that you inoculated your carbon. And then you mix those two together. And now you're taking it to IMO five and then you can solulize that down into a water like one to a thousand i think it is and you can just make a massive amount of spray and you can use it as a foliar spray you can use it as a seed starter spray you can use it as if you're planting trees you can use it on everything and there's these stories about trees that are completely dead that should be just cut down and taken out 
They sprayed it with a perfectly fermented solution. And within three years, a brand new tree grew right out of the trunk of an old tree and had massive foliage and was a brand new tree within three years. This stuff is crazy and it's gonna, it's gonna change the game, I promise. I'm done, sorry for taking up so much time. Uh, keep us updated. That, that, I mean, that is a very complex process. Oh. You're a freaking scientist now, man. Like that's. <laughs> yeah, you put me with a, a microbiologist or no a biology kidding. professor of 16 years. What do you expect to happen? That's, <laughs> that is so cool. And yeah, like I totally want to see how that works out for you. And it's it Omri and organic certified in the world. If you <laughs> implement this into your system and use it as your fertilizer and everything and there's a different solution for different problems and then his son went and made another one but that involves chemicals and stuff but it's completely 100 organic certified world recognized so if you implement it as your number one thing on your farm you can become organic certified without doing anything else that's so cool and i literally made my fpj out of stinging nettle from weeds in his yard you can make it out of you want to make it out of really rich weeds like uh purslane is really high in omegas and nitrogen so you make your fpj out of purslane so you don't have to like go buy something it's all within your area so it's all like a natural close the circle regenerative farming that we're after well, in about 12 months time, we're going to have you and Paul back to teach a class about um, Korean natural farming. Yeah, come to the, process. come to DCB, please. <laughs> come save us from ourselves. Well, it's my passion because it's a way to, if you make that spray and you just spray it on your soil and then put a cover crop on there the difference between even like adding a layer of compost and putting the cover crop on there without a spray to putting this spray on, it's gonna be astronomical. And I can't wait to show those results to people. But if anybody's interested in it and wants to dive deep, his name is Chris Trump. He is amazing. He is the, he's been to Korea 12 times to study with Master Chow and and in, in order to go to Korea, you have to either speak Korean or bring somebody with you that speaks Korean to translate everything. But he's been over there 12 times. He's got a 750-acre macadamia nut orchard in Hawaii that they switched to organic. And they've been doing it for 28 years. In the first 22 years, in the, the last six years after switching to organic, they've made more money in six years than they did in the previous 22 Boom. We better move on so we can hear about some other projects, but thank you, Shane. Um, Jess, you were working on some um, herbal products, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I have grown a section of the garden with some medicinal herbs um, that I intend on um once we get to that part of harvest, um, using it like utilizing the freeze dryer and creating some um, teas um, and herbal blends um, that can be used for um, some of it can be either used like for just drinking tea or bath tea um, or um, actually like incense or smudge mixes. Um, so we're gonna, I'm, I'm kind of exploring different like packaging and marketing options for that. So, um, and then I've also been helping out with, with their marketing and kind of their switching of the new business. I've um, helped draw up some logo designs and we'll like, that's kind of, kind of tacking on to the, uh, um, to my project. Cause it's not exactly like, it's not something that needs, like I need expenses for, but it's just kind of fun that I get to. I, I redid their logo design and get to help them with that kind of stuff. Um, but 
yeah, my, my project isn't really going to start until the fall until we can really dive into like focusing time on working on the apothecary stuff because right now it is we're starting harvest and just trying to keep up with cut flowers and market so yeah yeah awesome do you say a freeze dryer yeah they have um they have a commercial freeze dryer for um the culinary herbs um so yeah kind of focusing on the value added side of that by taking advantage of the really good equipment that they have so, That's really and cool. all of the all of the herbs and like they have quite a big stockpile of because they inherited this business so um they have quite a stockpile of herbs and like like peppermint and like kind of weird herbs that you wouldn't necessarily think to use dry on food that um we're gonna make a lot of cool like teas and foot scrubs and all these cool things like that with all the medicinal herbs and stuff so a little less scientific than, than Shane's project though but way cooler <laughs> they're all super cool um Gretchen I think you're the only one we haven't heard from all right, a couple of tough acts to follow there. Um, well, I'm trying to do vermiculture. I don't think my worms are doing so hot. Um, so the issue that they had, so they had a previous intern out here who did some vermiculture stuff. And the issue they had was, um, well, first of all, his worms disappeared. Like there weren't dead worms in the bin. They were just gone. I'm not sure if they crawled high and went down like a floor drain or what. Um, so that was kind of mysterious, but they also had the issue of not being able, not being able to do anything with their worms once it got cold. Um, so what I was trying to do was set up an outdoor system where they can get down low once it gets cold and just naturally go back into the garden. Um, and so I made it about three feet tall because they typically, or well, I made it about what, five feet tall. So they typically stay within the first three feet of soil. Um, and I filled it with just different soil mixes um, for a couple layers, like a potting soil, because that was what we had for the bottom layer. Um, and then some just dirt and rocks mixture, nothing too special about that one. Um, and then a layer of shavings and chicken manure. And then just some more basic black soil on top. Um, yeah, I think the problem though, is I'm not feeding them regularly enough and not getting them enough water. So yeah, with them being outdoor and with it being so hot, I think that they've been struggling, um, because of that. So what I'm thinking is I'm just going to collect some, so I collected them all. I didn't purchase any, so I'll either collect more worms or purchase some this time around and give it another shot but it's been it's been interesting just like observing them and seeing kind of how they interact and what they do um and learning about taking care of worms and um i guess like it was kind of interesting when i was looking for worms i went all around hunting for them different places like down by the river in the garden that kind of stuff um and there was one point when i was looking in the manure pile because they're um prominent in manure areas and I noticed, wait a second, it's really hot in the manure pile. So I know that they aren't going to be living here because the heat kills them. And it was just kind of, it just kind of naturally came to my mind. And I was like, oh my goodness, I learned something about worms and it came in handy. It was just kind of a cool moment, but yeah, that's kind of where my project is at right now. I think I need to reevaluate. Um, yeah, and this is our last week of having kiddos out at the ranch. So I'll have more time to focus on project now and give them a little bit more love yeah um have you done any reading about the types of worms I, I thought I read something that you need to use like the little tiny ones like red wigglers or something the red wigglers yeah there's three types of worms one that eats yep. compost and waste one that eats compost and one that eats earthworm like so there's earthworms that eat earth and so the red wigglers are best so if you're going to do it again purchase red wigglers 
But was your bin that you just dug in that layered system outside somewhere? Yeah, it's outside in the garden. And huh. I, yeah, I think I was using red wigglers. If, I mean, I did some like rudimentary worm identification. They're so but. tiny and they're, they're very few. And like it, when it rains, I go out and I try to collect them on the sidewalk. And there's like one to a hundred red wigglers to earthworms. <laughs> it sucks. Aww. I didn't realize that you could find them in the wild here. I, I thought you had to import them. Very rare. But, but they... And that could be part of the issue too. Um, yeah, if I had my worm identification wrong, which I very well might have. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. That's uh, part of the learning process. Yeah. And with all the projects, you guys are learning a ton just through the process, which is what this is all about. So, um, so we've had such a good discussion that I'm changing my tactic for our agenda tonight. I don't know if we're going to have time to really dive into recapping the sessions, which is fine because we can do that next week. Why don't we spend um, the last 15 minutes recapping um, the field days, especially the last field day, since it was it happened after our last class. So we didn't really get a chance to um, review it. Um, but before we start that, uh, I'm going to um, give you a sort of a homework for next week to make sure that um, I cover this before we run out of time. And what Felicity and I have done is we created a harvest document to help you reflect. Um, and I had intended to go through it together with you tonight and populate it with your responses. But since we're probably not gonna have time for that, I'm going to put the link to it in the chat so that you can look through it and do some reflecting for next week. And we'll, we will go through that in class next week. Um, so it's got you know the, the topics from each session and some of the key points you learned about. And um, your job is to just, you know, Look back, boy, I guess you don't have access to your experience reports, do you? Um, but maybe just look back through the homework and the recordings and think a little bit about uh, what, you what you did each week and what you learned. And also think about um, some of the things you've been learning through your projects, like did I, you know, did I, did I learn some new things? Did I build some problem solving skills? Did I build some leadership skills? Um, like Toby, you said, you know, this is going to be uh, a good learning experience to lead these tours on the 21st. Um, so um, what I wanted to talk about, about the field day was how it relates to what you learned about sustainable agriculture in week two. So if you remember week two, we talked about what, what does sustainability mean? Um, does anybody wanna venture? Um, what's, uh, what's one thing you remember about what makes this, what makes, agriculture sustainable? There were like three pillars of sustainability. So mm -hmm. it was like the social, emotional, the like, oh, now I forget the other two. <laughs> Oops. But I remember there was three pillars and I haven't People, written down some profit, yet. planet. Yeah, or- um, Equity, environment, economy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> three Ps or three Es, really good way to remember them. Um, when it comes to like farming, um, the ability to balance 
um, your like input and output based on the like ecosystem that you are like nurturing as tenders of the earth. Yes. Yeah. Yes, change from land owners to land caretakers. You're just stewards. preparing it for the next generation. We're stewards of the land. It's a great way to put it. Uh, okay, so last week, Thursday, um, we started out touring the dairy at, um, at Van de Bath Dairy. So what are some of the ways, um, what are some of the things you saw there that you felt either did fit well with our definition of sustainability or didn't fit. Um, I the, love, oh. Oh, go ahead. You go first, I'll go second. <laughs> okay, at the dairy, I really appreciated that they like kept their like breeding stock and their like, they kept kind of a cycle of uh, raising heifer calves and like, it was really cool to see like the different stages of that and how they really aren't buying new cows. They're kind of just keeping their family generations going essentially. And, and um, they, the fact that they also had their extra cattle purchased and um, they had those, those kind of like networks and those arrangements like that it was all kind of just, just a system that, kind of seemed to work like clockwork after I'm sure it was it took years to get there but like it was that was really impressive to see at that large scale definitely yeah like you said it was clockwork that kind of the way that they managed everything and had such a beautiful system that flowed non-stop though 24 hours a day just flowed and flowed and flowed and clean and the cows were happy and they it was an inherited wisdom passed down from generation to generation not something you can go and read a book about and learn that's a family run generational inheritance of wisdom that should be a place for other places to come and learn about how it could be done better because everything on that they did was just really, really spot on, I thought. Yeah. So with the people, planet, and profit, um, how did you observe them um, enacting social sustainability or people, community? Definitely in their, like, in their, like, secondary um that like relationship with the with the creamery and getting their name out and having their having their story like they had such a they had such a like interesting history to their to their business and how everything turned or like kind of fell into place for them and to be able to share that with like their community and like even further through their gelato business and now the like cheese business and and having that storefront as the face of the dairy in a way like yeah the dairy sends their product all over but to have that that like raw connection to that to the their community i think was a really really cool thing to see the value added side of it And I'm going to say that the way that the dairy was run, they selected the place for the people and then the people of the community, they also selected profit. They knew that they needed a big market in Fargo. So they had the people of the community that they loved. They had the profit availability in Fargo. So they've already closed two of the loops and then the way that they do everything and run at everything, they've really just come up with a system by implementing, I mean, it's a pretty clean place that they run there. They, they really covered all the loops there. When he said that 
well, we chose this location because of the people and because that we had an outlet in Fargo for our cast clay. Uh, they knew what they were doing before they chose where they were at. Yeah. Did, did you all hear him say that they uh, purchased uh, some of their feed from local farmers? That local farmers are growing some of the feed that the cows eat? Absolutely, yeah. They implement all kinds of clothes that. systems. It's awesome. Yeah. That's even better, <laughs> like, to, to see that kind of, like, that chain of production. Um, or what and, would be ways to become now food fodder for the cattle to eat yeah. and take it from all these different places. Mm -hmm. And it just like, it is like the way you put it, having like that closed loop of, of local support. I know he, I, he said they employ 25 people at the dairy and then it looked like they employed some people at the uh, Cows and Co Creamery. Um, we didn't really ask about like employment practices or how the workers are treated or paid, but so, I mean, that's, that's another element of social sustainability. Um, the only thing that they did say about that is that when they were milking 150 head of cattle, it wasn't enough to sustain that amount of cattle wasn't going to be enough to sustain multiple families. So that's why they chose the amount of cattle that they have right now to milk so that they could sustain four families. So there's multiple families being sustained by what they're doing by the amount of cattle that they have. So they must have some kind of head of cattle to family and worker payout. They have, they have it all figured out. I know they do. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think he mentioned some herd shares or something. Those of you who want to start your own farms, there's some like lessons to be learned there about the scale that's needed to really um, make a go of it. I mean, there are a lot of, I, I, I will have to admit that a lot of the farmers that farms serves, like who take farm beginnings, um, still have a, an off farm source of income or a day job because it's there does seem to be a certain a sweet spot where where you've achieved scale where you can make it go yeah I, on that one more um, that's the main thing that i've learned this year is about scale and the way that paul does it is farmers market only i could i want to be done roofing and start farming for a living i want to stop doing what I'm doing that's killing me and start doing something that's going to regenerate me but still hurt me <laughs> I mean it's not going to be easy work but what I'm doing I right now is that. a lot harder so I need to scale things to and so for Osley's farm they said okay we've tried so many things and then the high tunnel blowing off and so you have to find what you're going to scale up and be good at it and find a market for it Yep. without trying to be the guy from the book that you're reading. Yep. And I will tell you all, um, Felicity and I are both part of the North Dakota Local Food Development Alliance, and you guys are welcome to come to our monthly mm -hmm. online meetings. But, you know, we at farms know that you guys need to achieve scale to be successful as farmers. So, the Local Food Development Alliance is an organization of lots of different other small organizations working together to um, create those markets like farm to school and farm to institution. Um, could we form more cooperatives or food hubs so that you guys have the markets to sell into to um, achieve that scale and, be, and form successful businesses? What is that? The LFDA? Uh, yes, yeah, this Local. long acronym. No, um, our website is ndlocalfood.org. Okay. And I'll put that in the chat. Okay. Uh, and I was just down in Bismarck today 
uh, attending a meeting with the rural at the rural electric cooperative headquarters um, with a guy who from Texas who does a nonprofit that focuses on warehousing, talking with a bunch of state leaders about like how could we form um, food markets that are hubs around the state that would be places where local farmers could bring food to redistribute it. She was talking about that, uh, like a meeting that people can attend, like I could attend that, where you was talking about that? Um, there will be future meetings, yeah, that you can definitely attend. Whoa. This was just the first. That was going on. Wow, okay. Thank yeah. You. That's huge. It's, it's wow. slow going, but there are entities in the state that are working on it bit by bit. And um, there's uh, five grocery stores not too far from Gretchen in, in northeastern North Dakota. Uh, Hoople, Park River, uh, Fordville, um, and another one that I, Edinburgh. Um, tiny towns, tiny grocery stores, and they've banded together for shared purchasing. And then in Fordville, there's a locker system um, that will go live next week where customers, because there's no grocery store in that town, but customers can place their orders online and it's delivered from the nearest closest grocery store. So how can we, if, if they prove the model, then we can come along and also utilize that for local food production too. Oh my gosh, we can be the farms producing the food for those things. This is amazing. This is so exciting. Send you, can you put information about what you just talked about in the chat tour? Holy crap. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you're excited, Shane. Um, yes. Uh, I'm going to need a second to Google it. Uh, so the grocery store thing is called the Rural Access Distribution Hub. And North Dakota Rural Electric Cooperatives and rural, you know, REC and RTC, if you live somewhere rural where you um, get like the North Dakota Living Magazine, um, those guys are the ones behind this. And I know that it is, here we go. Um, I know that it's seven o'clock. Um, did you guys have any final questions or comments while I'm putting this in the chat? Okay, Shane, I just put a link to it's ndarec.com slash rural grocery. Um, if you go there, you can find out more about the grocery stores in Northeastern North Dakota. And above that is ndlocalfood.org. That's our North Dakota Local Food Development Alliance site. And we meet on the third Tuesday of the month at 2 p.m. We open the Zoom room at 1.45 for just conversation and social time. So we'll be meeting, gosh, on the 23rd. I, that's no the 16th oh my gosh that's next week already um so yeah i hope you i hope you join us and i'll make sure felicity sends out information to you all awesome thank you so much absolutely and jill is part of that jill who sent you to us jill hawkinson of course she is of course she is <laughs> Well, guys, I don't want to um, keep you past seven o'clock. Um, like I said, you've got the link to that Google Doc um, to start reflecting for next week. And I'll send that out um, this evening after class. Um, uh, if you would take some time to submit your experience reports, I'm we're missing experience reports from some of you. Um, and those just you know, help you reflect, but also um, we use the information that you submit on those. Um, we use it for marketing. We use it to evaluate our programs. So that is really helpful um, for us to get those. Um, 
And this week uh, is payroll week. So if you, for any reason, have not yet submitted your time card, please do so because um, I've approved most of them. But if any have come in today, I will approve those this evening because Jennifer um, runs payroll on Wednesdays. So um, we'll need to do that. And thank you to those that have submitted them. After this um, pay week, are we able to see or like find out how many hours we have left? Absolutely. Available? Yep, we could probably do that. To, I could probably do that tomorrow. Felicity okay. is at a wedding in Idaho, but uh -huh. we have access to that. Okay, sounds good. I just, yeah, to plan the fall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, any last questions? Thanks for a great discussion, you guys, and we will see you next week. Thanks, Thank Stephanie. you, Stephanie. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.